because I'm uh, here in the cellar, so there is people going uh, around. So. <laughs> it's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. It's a Midsummer's Day grape gab dream up in here, Val. Are you feeling that? I am feeling that. I'm feeling that big, bigly. <laughs> <laughs> big and dreamy and big and summery. Big and summery. It's a hot. Midsummer Day's grape gab say that 10 times and it <laughs> is if, and if you can believe it we're going to be having a grape gab but Steph we're not going to be doing all the gabbing yeah we're not gabbing we got somebody else who is it that's right we have Andrea Costa from Marenco Vini in Piemonte and he was kind enough to spend some time on Skype a couple of weeks ago, laying down some 411 for us on Albarosa, and he told me I could use part of this conversation. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Now, we don't have the Albarosa in our glasses. Thus, that's the name of the grape. But we do have a special treat in, in lieu of that until we can get our hands on some Albarosa. So what do we have in our glasses, Steph? Well, some of you might remember back in episode 111, it was our millennial moment with Andrew, and he gave a factoid about a wine that Val and I had never experienced before, and that was about May wine, a German tradition, German and Austrian tradition, and so Andrew was kind enough to send us both bottles, one for Val up in the Springs and one for myself in the FOCO. And so Val and I decided we would try it together on the show. That's right. We're trying it together. We're trying May wine in July because that's how we <laughs> roll in the middle of a Tuesday summer afternoon and it's not May and we don't care and all that. So let's talk about the May wine stuff. Tell us about this stuff. Oh, you are so funny. It's not May and we don't care. I love it. <laughs> so this bottle we've got is a non-vintage wine that's aromatized, okay? And that's what this tradition is um, around May time, uh, springtime, right? And so this bottle is blended and bottled by the Glunz Family Winery and Cellars, and that's spelled G-L-U-N-Z. And this comes from Gray's Lake, Illinois. The white wine uh, is actually from California. They have a Paso Robles um, winery. And, and then it is blended and bottled there in Illinois. And it's flavored or aromatized with this woodruff, okay, which is an herb. And so that is really what makes this wine unique. And it is a off dry, you know, semi sweet style of wine. It's also inexpensive and kind of refreshing and appley, you know, what do you what do you have to say about it, Val? Yeah, I think it reminds me more of fall. And I'm not sure why, but I can see this, you know, those last days of Indian summer where you're just getting a hint of fall in the air, but you know fall's coming, but you're still trying to hang on to summer as long as you can and keep from wearing socks at any cost. And, and I could see like making an end of summer, like sangria, barbecue, patio, friends, and putting like some blood oranges and pears, some apples. And I could see like putting that in there and making that. This would be perfect with that. So it's refreshing, but it's still got a warming thing. So maybe instead of dancing with flowers in our hair, like maybe <laughs> is the tradition and harkens to May Day, I can see this is a late September fun wine to have. And so, yeah, it's definitely easy to drink. Not a lot of acidity at all. It, it's going down. It reminds me of a little bit, like you said, like apple cider or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Justin tried it. He thought... It tasted very much like apple juice and in a pleasant way. Mm -hmm. And the recommendation on the Glunt's website is to also add some sparkling 
wine and to throw in some uh, fresh sliced strawberries. Yeah. So you definitely can use it in sort of a spiced sangria type of a drink. And I, I would totally want to try that too. And I would also like to try some of this May, May wine in Germany or in Austria and see really how it compares to the um, American version. But this Glunz family originally is from Germany, and this is a tradition at their winery. They make this wine all year round, and it is available on the winery's website. And they also make some other wines like Sangria, Glug, and uh, Glog. You say glug, I think it is. I don't know. I probably, I don't know if that's like a glue vine or, or what that is. And then uh, some fortified wines. They have definitely a selection of things. But most of all, we just want to thank Andrew for bringing this into our world and, and being so generous to send us something um, that was really sweet. So thank you so much, Andrew. And um, I think we should get into the Albarossa excitement of today. Yes, absolutely. But before I do that, Andrew, I, I wanted to say thank you as well. And I don't know where you buy your wines, but I respect the hell out of the fact that the sticker on my bottle says jeans sausage <laughs> on the price tag. So if you're buying your wine in a sausage joint, bro, I respect that. I think that is awesome. <laughs> and I don't know why Colorado can't get on board. I want a sausage store where I can buy wine. But anyway, let's go back to... I think, Val, <laughs> Val, you need to take a photo of that sticker and it should go in the blog. And I did and I will because it's so funny. It just says right by the Glunz family crest, it says Jean Sausage 1099. So <laughs> I, I respect that. I mean, that's just... And that would be good with this too, actually. So, but thanks, Andrew. Yeah. We love our, our millennial guy and, and well, hopefully... Hopefully we'll be hearing more from Andrew in the future as well. Have some more millennial moments with him. But let's get back to our Albarossa moment. We're going to talk about this red grape today because it's so unique to Piemonte. In fact, I've yet to see where it's grown outside of Piemonte. And I even asked one of the winemakers and he couldn't place it outside of Italy either. But we're going to be talking about a grape today that's it's not really... I want to say it's not new because it was created 80 years ago, but compared to some of the other grapes, it is a new grape. And it's still considered an indigenous grape to Italy. So about 80 years ago, there was a professor named Dalmaso, and he was in Turin, and he crossed two grapes. And the reason they were doing this is because they wanted Nebbiolo to be darker in the glass. If you ever see Nebbiolo in the glass, it's really limpid. You know, it's it's got a nice... Pinot yeah, kind of Yeah, color. yeah. It can be confused with Pinot and once you, until you get the tannins, you know, on the palate there. <laughs> so he created this back in 1938. So that was nearly 80 years ago. But we're going to let Andrea tell you the rest of the story. Oh, yeah, exactly. This is uh, another indigenous variety that we like a lot. And with a completely different story compared, for example, to Caricalasino, because Caricalasino is very old and with very ancient. Yeah. The Albarossa is new, so it's a, it's a sort of an innovation because uh, the origin was in 1938, and um, there was, a, at the time, uh, it was very hard to make uh, Nebbiolo with, uh, with a nice color mm -hmm. because, you know, Nebbiolo has a lot of everything, but it lacks some color. So now, now it, with the techniques, uh, we get wonderful wines from Nebbiolo. But back in the time, it was to get the color. So the agronomist and the enologist and the University of Torino, they were working uh, for giving more color to, to Nebbiolo. And so they have crossed the flowers of uh, Nebbiolo with a bunch of different varieties from Piemonte. Okay. And not only from Piemonte. And they cross uh, Barbera with the Nebbiolo turned out to be very, very interesting, enologically speaking. So they have renamed it Albarossa okay. and they have uh, uh, stored it in the, in the um, let's say, University Vineyards okay. in Torino okay. and in the surrounding. Then the, the World War uh, came, so there was other priorities. The project has been forgotten for, for a while, for like 50 or 60 years. You know, sometimes we 
were kind of long. Right. Uh, and, and, and then in, uh, in 2000 or 2001, a group of um, wineries, including Marenko and a um, few other very good wineries from uh, Piemonte, decided to restart the research on, on, this, uh, on this grape uh, and they started to make wines, uh, micro vinification. Um, of Albarossa in order to study how to make it and so on. It was six wineries. There was Marenco, there was Michele Chiarlo, there was uh, Prunotto, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, different wineries from Monferrato and Lange. Okay. And, uh, and so that's how the, the grape has restarted to, to be uh, cared about. It was 2001 and we've been one of the first wineries to, to plant a, a vineyard of Albarossa. And now it's growing. We were like five wineries. Now it's like 70 wineries okay. proposing uh, Albarossa. In the, mean, in the meanwhile, they have discovered that the Nebbiolo that was the parent of Albarossa is not the Nebbiolo for Barolo, but it's, uh, it's Chateau, which is a, um, more a French um, uh, vine, a French grape, yeah. uh, which is also planted in, uh, in Piemonte in, uh, in the area of Dronero. And in fact, it's called Nebbiolo di Dronero. Okay. Uh, this is this is something they didn't know that the people that made the Albarossa in 1938 they didn't know that they just uh, they thought it was the standard Nebbiolo, and they just realized that the grape was fantastic. Okay. Uh, now with the DNA test again, we we have discovered this uh, real origin of Albarossa. But anyways, what is important is that this grape is very good, and the the, the wine that comes out you will taste it, and I think it's very very interesting. <laughs> yeah. I'm very excited to taste it. So wasn't that interesting stuff? I mean, they thought for all these years until 2009 that it was actually the Nebbiolo grape when it was a Nebbiolo di Dronero or what they call Chateau grape, which is originally from the Ardash region in France. But all these years, they thought it was a Nebbiolo. Well, there's this, I mean, the DNA testing now and all of the cool cutting edge science in wine making and in the wine industry it is just enlightening i mean so much mystery and tradition and storytelling is now actually either proven to be correct or proven to be false (laughs) they have the proof now so that is cool and then let's let's get into some of the wine making and what makes the grape special because we know they're small and thick-skinned but let's uh, have Andrea tell us how he makes the Marenco Albarosa. So that was your first vintage. If they were planted in 2001, had to be what, 2005 was your first vintage? Yeah, but we skipped 2005 because okay. um, we did some tests. And so, so the first vintage was 2006. 2006, okay. 2006. 2006, then uh, six and seven, to be honest with you, we were still testing. Okay. Because it was a completely a new grape, so you don't know how many days... You want to macerate the skins with the with the juice during fermentation. You don't know how to age it. So uh, this this particular grape, for example, has a, a, a small berry and and a thick skin. So we get a lot of uh, extraction from the skins, only in general, so tannins, um, antochans. So we don't need a very long uh, maceration. Okay. Uh, actually, we do like five six days, and then we do the rest of the fermentation as a white wine with no skins wow. because we have enough yeah if you when you, you will taste the wine you will see this very dark nice color and a lot of complex flavors because of this uh, shape of the of the grapes yeah uh, so the first two vintage was uh, let's say test and then since 2009 uh, this is how we do it regularly every year okay and then I see that you age half of it in Barrique and half of it in larger barrels. Is that correct? Ex- uh, yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's correct. We like the the larger barrel. It's uh, we use fifteen hectoliters, which is a medium uh, size. Right. And uh, and barrique, but okay. we like to have uh, we blend it at the now. For, for example, we are doing the, the the tastings of the barriques and all the big barrels. We have uh, in order to see how to do the blend and to do the um, uh, bottling for the two thousand and fifteen vintage. Okay. which is going to be bottled in the next two weeks. Oh, wow. I have a question for you about how much Albarosa you have and how much is grown in Italy and, if you know, around the world. How many people are playing with Albarosa outside of Italy? 
uh, outside of Italy, yeah, I don't know. No, no idea. <laughs> I think it's still, it was born here in Piemonte and it is growing in Piemonte. Okay. Um, we started with five producers and probably five actors maximum. Okay. And I know that now there are 70 or 80 producers um, and there are about 300, 250,000 bottles produced. I cannot wait to try this wine, how they age it, uh, partly in small barrels and then the big barrels and the way they don't have a very long fermentation because of the skins being so full of anthocyanins and phenolics. I think that's going to be a really fun balance to achieve. I think it's going to be a very fun wine to drink. So I'm looking forward to trying that wine next month, if not before then. So let's talk about the wine in the glass. For somebody who hasn't tasted Alborosa, or for anyone that does listen and wants to hear about, how would you describe your Alborosa wine to somebody who's looking? Well, it's a first, first, uh, first approach to the wine is the color, and when you see the color of Alborosa, you see it dark, you see it intense. So it's a wine with character, definitely. And then the the noise, the noise is complex, complex in a in a nice way. I mean, it's complex but easy to to approach. People that taste the Albarossa in the cellar, it's a wine that they love at the first sight. Uh, someone says it's a sexy yeah. wine because it's a it has fruit, it has a, um, um, red fruits, but it also has some spices. It has some nutmeg, so it's and it's really evolving with the every time you 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 feel the wine. And then the taste is really Piemonte. The, the Piedmont comes out in the taste because we have this uh, full body and the, and the nice acidity. And the acidity, you know, when you, when you pair with the food, it's okay. helpful. So it's always fresh. It's always good. I would, I would see it. Sorry for, for the vegans, but I would see it very good with a nice steak, a bloody steak with yeah. the Albarossa, for example. It's, yeah. it's very good. And also a little chill maybe with pizza. It's something that I can I can see very nice. And of course we can try. When I go to the States or when I go abroad in general, I like uh, always, uh, I learn new new pairings, w which are very fantastic. So the pairings is, is something very, some, someone for example told me that they use albarossa with the fish. Uh, why not? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, with maybe some fat fish, like some uh, soup or some something like that. I can see yeah, that. Yeah, something so. with a nice hearty, earthy sauce, like a salmon with a even a bourbon glaze, you could go. I, exactly. Yeah, red wine does go with fish in the right situation. And I think... Oh, yeah. So now I'm so excited. I mean, I was excited before that I'm taking your class, Val, Yay. with Suzanne and, and those wines. But now hearing hearing more about it and, and how it goes with so many different kinds of food and it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm totally excited. Uh, there's going to be lots of pictures and definitely when we do our follow up uh, episode mm -hmm. from the conference, we'll have more to talk to and share with everybody. But also, it's good to know how long does an Alborosa wine last? How long can you keep it? So let's have Andrea tell us a little bit about that. The last question I had for you was aging. How long can you age your Alborosa? Uh, this is a good question. And um, let's say that our um, library of Alborosa goes back to 2009. Okay. And 2009 is still very mm -hmm. fresh. The, the, again, it's it's wine from Piedmont, so the, the, the acidity uh, is there. And the, 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 the tannins are also there, that they preserve the wine from the oxidation. And the evolution is, uh, 2009 is still very fresh. I mean, you can, you wouldn't say it's a seven years old wine. It's, it's, really, it's really still really young and a wine with a very uh, long aging potential. Mm -hmm. So basically what he told us is that the oldest one they have dates back to 2009, and it's still drinking quite youthful. So I think it'll be a while before we know how long a an Alborosa can age, you think? Yeah, it sounds like, you know, they want to, you know, get be patient and, and not necessarily. He didn't seem to uh, have an answer because it sounds like going back to this, it's a new grape, even though it might be 80 years mm -hmm. old, that is still new. It really is. So there's a lot more to discover here, and um, which makes it kind of fun. 
which is why we're always learning. You know, even if you have a bunch of uh, alphabet soup behind your name, we're all always learning. And so are these winemakers. That's right, because they only planted their vines in 2001. So I think as the vines age, a lot of times when you have older vines, you get more concentrated grapes. So these grapes will be more concentrated still. Yeah. Yeah, totally. As time goes on. So it'll be interesting because for some vines, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old is old. For some vines, that's too old. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, where this goes. But I, I don't know about you, Steph, yeah. but I like what's weird. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? When I, I have was sharing an Austrian rosé, frizzante rosé last night with friends and it's just, you know, it was weird. That's why I picked it up. I'm like, how often do you drink Austrian frizzante of Pinot Noir, you know? So it has this picture of a cow on it. Anyways, it was <laughs> it was really good. Okay, so we do love all of these obscure things. And sometimes that becomes something new for our wino radar or yours. But Val, what do you have this week on your wino radar? Well, as you guys know that we are going to be talking about this wine at the Society Wine Indicators Conference. And it is one of the wines that we have lined up to present so I was just going to link up the article that I did on the conference preview. I mean, even though that session is full, it might be kind of cool to see what is ahead for that conference. So I did a little preview. I'll link up that article. I'll also link up Marankovini, their website, and particularly the page about their uh, Alberosa. And what is also on my wino radar is this website that I didn't know about. It's called the Vitis International Variety Catalog, the VIVC. And it's just, it's a geek fest. I mean, it has, oh you can go gosh. in and pull up the grape and color of the berry skin and the original species and it's hermaphrodite and how the seeds and it's just all this stuff and where they get information. In, in fact, uh, the synonyms for this grape, uh, the Dalmaso is a synonym for the grape because of the person who created it, Professor Dalmaso. And also it's called Incrocio Dalmaso, which is which means Dalmaso cross. Incrocio Dalmaso XV-31 or 15-31. So that it has two synonyms. And all this is on this website. So I'll link that up and you guys can geek out on that because because that's fun. But what about your... That is fun. Now, who's who is doing this? This, it, this is yeah. Cool. It's the Julius Kuhn's Institute, Federal Research Center for Cultivated Plants. I don't know where this is. It sounds German. Wow. Yeah. Oh wait, Geil Wellerhof Institute for Grapevine Breeding. Oh, it says Germany, Germany. Federal Research Institute. Yeah, in Germany. Yeah. Very cool and good find. That's so cool. I like that. That's a good resource. Oh my gosh, yeah. Totally geeky. Super geeky, super cork dorkery. Yeah. So how about your uh, wino radar there this week? Well, I um, have something on my radar and I still can't believe I didn't know about it, but it was called Bottle Rock in Napa Valley. And when I was riding in an Uber with my friend Anika this uh, Saturday, she was telling me how it's the second year in a row that she's been to Bottle Rock. And she just saw Maroon 5 there, and she had so much fun. So put it on your calendars. If you're into concerts, you love celebrity chefs, wine, beer, and sexy people, then May 25th through the 27th of 2018, you might want to go to Bottle Rock. And I have a linky link for you to check it out. And there's also a video recap of this year and Val you would be totally dancing while you're watching this video but it's just it's looks like a hell of a good time and um so yeah so that's new for me and I just want to give a couple of reminders as well um happy hour for wine two five listeners will be in Portland August 9th at the Vault Martini and please RSVP. You can check out all the information on our show notes and Facebook. And then also please, please go out there and vote for the podcast awards. And you can do that at any time until the voting closes July 
first. Go to podcastawards.com and look for the nominations. And we are under the arts category and we would appreciate that. So you've got about not even two weeks left for that. So shout out, Steph, who are we shouting out to this week? I'm going to give all of my love and affection to Lune Bosoni Winery in Liguria. I'm not sure if I have told you guys all about this, but I refer to this wine as my wedding wine. It is a Vermentino. I did buy a case last year and I bought it again this year. I love, love, love Lune. And so does everybody else. I'm not lying. And this is why I'm so excited and I love them even more is because when I was at Sholan restaurant in Denver, I saw that Lune now has, well, maybe they've had it and I didn't know about it. So, but they have a rosado that's called Maya Rosa and it's a Vermentino Nero and oh my God, it met all of my expectations and it was the ultimate refreshment and now I'm going to have to go buy a case of that. So I just want to say I love you, Lune. You guys make such beautiful wine and thank you. All right. What about you, Val? Where's your love going? My love's going to Andrea Costa from Marenko for sitting down and chatting with me about this Albarosa grape and their wines. He was so personable, as you guys can tell, so friendly. And he was just sitting there at the winery and, you know, things were happening around him. And, and I was sitting here with a picture of him pruning the vines with Suzanne's book open. I'm like, this is you. Oh, my God. You know, so, yeah. 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 So thank you. Grazie tanto. Andrea for uh, sitting down and talking with me. I think that was so cool. And for Suzanne for connecting me with all these amazing winemakers trying to put these slides together. And, and I'm going to work with Suzanne this week on our presentation up in Vail. So we'll be working on that and uh, trying to get everything ready for August. So that's where my love is going. And we got some more love going out too, Steph, don't we? More love for our Patreons. Hell yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, you guys, for supporting our show and helping us do what we do every week. To our tenacious tasters, Jeff E. from the We Like Drinking podcast, Lynn from Savor the Harvest, Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours, and It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners, thank you to Meg, Clay, John, Andrew, Aswani, Chantel and Mary Lou and to our winetastic listener Laura thank you everybody you can also jump on the Patreon bandwagon at any time and you can help support our show it's so easy to do and it really is inexpensive because it's just like hanging out with us and buying us a glass of wine on happy hour pricing <laughs> I mean <laughs> Val, why should people become a Patreon supporter? Well, you get early releases of our episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, and some serious swag. I mean, we have good swag. And then every month we draw a winner for our surprise wine gift. So any Patreon supporter at the tastemaker level and higher, which is just $2 a month, and you can be entered to win. July's prize was a signed copy of Lisa Matson's book, X is in my glass, and that went out to Eswani. I think Steph mailed that out this week. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think she's pretty excited about that. So if you want to get in on the monthly wine goodies, then go to our Patreon page for details at patreon.com backslash wine to five podcast. You can also share the Wine to Five podcast. Don't be selfish. You can subscribe to our show, <laughs> share it, link it, tweet it, Facebook it, grab someone's phone and say, here, let me do something for you. Click subscribe, push play, leave us a burning wine question or a comment on SpeakPipe and you can hear your voice on the show. And that's for everybody. You can join the conversation on our private Facebook group called the Wine to Five Community. Write us a review on Apple Podcasts or iHeartRadio if you'd like, or just head over to our website. We have a store there. There are plenty of wine books, accessories, links for everything pretty much that we talk about on the show. And Everything's on our website. The Facebook links, the Twitter links, the Pinterest, YouTube, Google Plus links. I'm Val. I'm on Twitter. 
I'm at Wine Gal Unboxed and also on the Vino with Val Facebook page, Instagram, and Pinterest as well. And Steph, well, then you can find her on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest as the Wine Heroine. And you can connect with her personally on Facebook. But that's all we have for you guys this week. So until next week, cheers. cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.